scattered. Let them that hate you flee from you, for out of Zion shall go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Blessed be he who in his holiness gave the Torah to his people, Yisrael. Ya'amod, Yoav, ben Ariel Torah. Baruch at Adonai Hamvarach, Baruch Adonai Hamvarach Leolam Vaed. Baruch at Adonai Elohenu Melech Olam, Asher Bachar Banu Mikol, Ha'amim Venatan Lanu at Torato, Baruch at Adonai Noten HaTorah. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One, for all eternity. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all people, gave us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. Yeladim. Let us bow our heads as we lift up our children to the Lord God. Heavenly Father, we pray that you look down upon the children, the future of our congregation, Lord, and that your favor would be upon them. We ask, Father, that you would dwell in their hearts, Lord, from an early age, and that you would raise them up in your word that each person here would take on the responsibility that you've put upon them to raise this next generation, Lord, to not just know you, but to become leaders, to become lights in this dark and fallen world for your name and for your sake. We pray, Father, your blessing over them, that you would keep them shielded from all harm, both physical and spiritual. We ask, Father, that your blessing be upon them. Bless them, Lord, as Ephraim and Manasseh, as Sarah, Rachel, Rebecca, and Leah. We pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Ve'idabel Yehovah el Moshe le'emor, dabel el b'nei Yisrael le'emor isha ki tezriya v'yeldata v'yelda zachar v'tam'a shivat yamim ki mai nidat hota titma. וביום השמיני אימול בשר אר לטו. Praise the Lord of Shua Mashiach. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman hath conceived seed and born a man child, then she shall be unclean seven days, according to the days of the separation for her infirmity shall she be unclean. And in the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. Amen. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, asher natan lanu Torah emet v'chai olam nata, betochenu baruch atah Adonai notein ha-Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and has planted eternal life within us, Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Vazot ha-Torah, sher sam Moshe lifnei ben Yisrael al piyadonai b'yon Moshe. And this is the Torah that Moses placed before the children of Israel at the command of the Lord through Moses' hand. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. This Torah scroll is the Word of God, Yeshua is this Word. John the Immerser said in John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God's word is written on lambskin, Yeshua is this lamb. In John 12, 32, Yeshua said, And I, if I'm lifted from the earth, I'll draw all people to myself. The two wooden poles holding this Torah scroll are called Eitz Chaim, or Tree of Life. Yeshua was sacrificed on two wooden poles some 2,000 years ago for our sins. Amen. Eitz Chaim, hi l'machazakim b'av t'umchei ha-mushar, d'archei d'akeno am v'kol n'tafetecha shalom, eshevenu d'anai lecha v'neshu v'chadei shimenu k'kadem. It is a tree of life to those who take hold of it. Happy are those who support it. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Cause us to return to you, Adonai, and we shall return. Renew our days as of old. Revelation 2.7 reads, You as an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the congregations. To him who overcomes, I'll give to eat from the tree of life, 
which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Yeshua was, is, and shall ever be this word of the one living God. And we look upon this day for our salvation. Amen. You may be seated. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. I'm glad to see everyone here this morning. Everyone survived the eclipse. <laughs> no one was raptured away. No one was overtaken by the crowds. Um, civil war didn't break out or anything like that. And certainly, you may, when you look at the title up there, responding to the sign of Jonah, if you were listening to some people on YouTube and other social media over the last several weeks or months, you may have heard about a so-called sign of Jonah. And they were trying, and there's many people trying to tie the eclipse into this sign of Jonah, this idea that it's a sign of judgment that, um, that God is showing. Now, where did this come from? Because and we're going to walk through it this morning, an eclipse has nothing to do with the sign of Jonah. When Yeshua makes reference to the sign of Jonah, it has nothing to do with the eclipse or any celestial movements of the moon, the stars, the sun, or anything. So where is this coming from? Well, if you listen to people, and I didn't really want to listen to them, but I, you know, I wanted to do some research, like where is this even coming from? It comes down to, um, years ago, there was a, bi a biblical scholar who noticed that, um, and I don't know if this was through NASA or j just other calculations, that um, there was an eclipse in the year 763 BCE on June 15th um, that passed right by the city of Nineveh, where Nineveh, would, would, Nineveh today, of course, doesn't exist, but it would be near Mosul in northern Iraq. That'd be where it is to, um, today. And, you know, it was under, it saw this, that it was 763. Now, reality is we have no idea what year Jonah went to the city of Nineveh to um, take his message that God had placed upon him to call the Ninevites to repentance. But it certainly... You know, when was Jonah active? The Bible doesn't help, doesn't give us any information that we can like narrow it in on a specific date or anything. But it would have been around this time in the 760s, give or take a couple decades. Though I mean, he, it could have been the 750s, it could have been the seven or the, the, the 770s. It's somewhere in that time period. But there's no way for us to say that when that eclipse occurred, that Jonah was actually in Nineveh. But that's where this idea comes from. And then you start to see all of these, these teachers that were trying to make this, um, saying, well, this eclipse that's occurring is a sign of Jonah. And, you, and when you actually listen to them, a lot of what they were saying just doesn't make sense. And you're wondering, where are they coming up with this information? And like just one example of this is because they were saying, because, you know, Jonah's message is a, is a message of repentance. And they were trying to tie it to... to the, the movement of the sun and the moon and everything. And I saw one person who was trying to claim that when this eclipse occurred in 763, and he fully believed this eclipse occurred at the time Jonah was going to Nineveh, that he said, well, it just so happens that eclipse occurred on the first of Elul, which the sixth month, which as we do know, is the beginning of a period of 40, 40 days of all. Uh, 40 days of all leading up to Yom Kippur, which are days of repentance. But then when I looked at it, and, I, and he said, and it was like, but it says it occurred on June 15th on our calendar. 
If anyone has any basic understanding of the Hebrew calendar, you know the first of Elul cannot occur in the month of June. It can't even occur in the month of July. The earliest Elul starts is in very early August. And so it's like, where do these people come up with these ideas? I mean, are they hearing it from someone else? Are they, they, it, it just shows that they're grasping for straws and they're just making things up as they go along. The other thing that kind of jumped out at me is they were making, um, there was a lot of it, well, it occurred on Nisan 1 or Aviv 1, the beginning of the month of Nisan when Passover falls, that this eclipse um, last week, that that occurred. Well, okay, yes, um, but, you know, if we begin to look at every single solar eclipse that occurs, because the wet, what happens in when, how the, the sun and the moon have to line up right, an eclipse can only occur during a new moon. Because when in the moon's in the full moon, when, when we see the full moon, the Earth's on the other side. It can't, it's on the back side of Earth. It can't cast its shadow onto the Earth. It can only cast its shadow in the new moon phase. So when you start to think about it, if every time an eclipse happens and we're going to try to tie it to something biblical, well, there's a one in six chance, or about a 16% chance, it's always going to be the first of Aviv or it's going to be the first of Tishri, Rosh Hashanah. So it's very easy, and then you're going to try to throw in the first of Elul with the beginning of the days of all. Now we're down to one-fourth of all. Yeah, it's going to make sense that we can tie it to something biblical because the new moon is something significant on God's calendar. But it's too easy to make these connections. And like, I don't think people always grasp what these people are doing that try to, make, to, to tie all these things together. And I could spend an entire teaching being down on these types of false prophecies and teachings that we have out there. And I actually was originally inclined to do that because of my worry, my concern of the, how it, the false expectations that it sets up for believers who listen to those types of teachings. But instead, this morning instead, I want to focus on the sign of Jonah, not what everyone was saying before the eclipse, and I'm sure we'll still hear people make ties to it. Um, you know, some of the people were saying this was a sign that a civil war was going to start in the United States. Well, I'm not convinced that civil war is going to start this year, but I do know we have a very contentious election coming up in November. And depending on what happens around that or after that, we may see some unrest. And I guarantee you they'll be like, see, the eclipse was predicting that. This was a sign of that because they're going to look for those connections. But that doesn't mean it was a sign of Jonah. And so what is the true sign of Jonah? Because that's extremely important for us to understand. It's very basic and foundational, actually, to what we believe. And when we see it tied to eclipses and gloom and doom prophecies, what it can cause the, the follower of Yeshua to do is com to completely miss the mark on what the sign of Jonah truly is and how we should be responding to it. So when we turn to the, so we're going to turn to the person of Jonah in the Tanakh here. We're going to look at the prophet. And the first thing we should note is we, we talk all the time how many of the people in the Old Testament, whether it's Joseph or David or it's Elijah or, or Moses, there's many people we can look to how they are antitypes or, you know, they're, they're precursors to the Messiah. And certainly we can say the same with, with Jonah, that he is an antitype of Yeshua, especially as it relates to this time on the calendar, meaning that we now have entered into the month of Aviv and we are in the two weeks leading up to Passover right now. Because when we look at this relatively short book of, of Jonah, all, of the, all except the very end, because Jonah's attitude at the end does not prefigure Yeshua's. But all that leading up to the end of the book, it prefigures what Yeshua would experience passing through Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits on the year that he died on the cross and then rose from the dead. Now, of course, seeing a connection between the journey of Jonah and Yeshua's death and resurrection shouldn't be surprising to anyone who knows the Gospels, because this is exactly what Yeshua was referring to when he spoke about Jonah and this sign of Jonah that would be given. Matthew 12, 38 through 40 says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answering, answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. 
and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. So when we hear this, you know, the first question, even before we get specifically the sign of Jonah, is just a bigger question of why is there such a fascination among believers with signs? Because what does Yeshua say right here? An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. So why is there so much in the body of Christ, or at least, though, you know, some may be true believers, some may not when we think about those people that are out there on social media. Because reality is a lot of them, I truly believe, are just after clicks, because that's what gets the advertisers on their pages, and that's how they make money. But why this fascination with signs? Yeshua should be, tells us right there, you, if you are with me, if you follow righteousness, you wouldn't be seeking after signs. And I'm even going to bring in another verse, since we just passed through the eclipse and all these people that were looking at it. I didn't ha- I, it's not up here, but Jeremiah 10.2. Listen to what it says. Thus says the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them. Now again, this is important to say. It's not saying don't observe and don't look at signs but don't be dismayed by him he's telling them there's no reason to fear the signs that we may see in the heavens even if it truly is a sign that may be um a portent uh, may be um signaling that god is moving in some way there should be no spirit of fear towards those signs we shouldn't be dismayed by them and really you know when Again, looking at the, the, the people that were getting worked up over, over this, that goes back to my teaching from a few months ago. Why are we majoring in the minors and not minoring? You know, why are we majoring in the minors? And then what that, does that cause us to do? We minor in the majors. We're taking our focus off of what truly matters. This is what Michael's teaching was about last week. You know, regardless of what's occurring in the heavens, preach the gospel. Regardless of what's happening with the red heifer in Israel, Preach the gospel. All that other stuff, and I don't want to ever say God's not working in them, but don't let it distract from what our commission is. To be lights of this world, to go out and preach the good news to the lost, and then to follow the commandments and take care of the poor and the downtrodden, the, the widow and the orphan, and so on. But in these words of Yeshua here in Matthew, Yeshua makes clear what he's referencing when he talks about the sign of of Jonah. He didn't have an eclipse in mind or any type of sign in the heavens because he clearly says that the Son of Man would spend three days in the heart of the earth just as the prophet prophet experienced in the belly of the fish. And we hear of that in Jonah 1.17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, it'd be very easy for me to take a detour here to discuss whether the three days and three nights here mentioned by Yeshua, are they literally three days and three nights as we do believe here? Or as others may argue, they're just a passing reference to three partial days. But I'm not going to do that this morning, even though I personally find that to be a really fascinating study, because there again, it's ultimately a distraction to the greater and more important parallels that exist between Jonah's journey to Nineveh and the Messiah's death and resurrection. For if we look at what occurs to Jonah and the purpose of his calling to minister to Nineveh, we see that the sign Yeshua was referencing, was referring to, extends well beyond the time period involved in the fish and involved in the grave, respectively. So in order to see this, let's go through the story of Jonah. And we're not going to read all the verses, but it's a, it's a well-familiar story to all of us. Um, it's in most children's Bibles. You may have seen the Veggie Tales movie that was made of it years ago. Um, we all know this. So we all know that Jonah is a prophet of God, and he's called by God to go pe- uh, preach a message of repentance to the city of Nineveh. 
And of course, this greatly distresses Jonah, not because some, as sometimes is misunderstood that he was fearful to go do this, because Nineveh, we have to remember, is the capital of the Assyrians, the primary empire at that time in, in the Middle East, an empire that was expanding its territories and no nation could stand up to its armies. It was just mowing down every army it came across, every walled city it came to, it mowed them down. But it wasn't out of fear. Jonah didn't want to go because Assyria, Nineveh, was the oppressor of the Israelites. They would go to war with Israel. And he didn't want to go preach a message of repentance because he, what he truly feared is if they respond to it, God's going to forgive them. He's going to forgive the enemies of Israel. And Jonah didn't want that. So that's why Jonah ends up fleeing. And as we know, he gets on the boat. He go, it's just like, I'm going to get as far away from Nineveh as I possibly can. So I'm going to go down to the port of the Mediterranean Sea, get on a boat, and I'm going to Tarshish. I'm going to Spain. I'm going as far away as at that time you could conceivably get. And as we know, what happens? God ends up sending a storm um, that then leads to the sailors asking Jonah, what did you do to make God angry? And at this point, Jonah decides to do what? He actually decides to do something that's kind of noble. In that he says he was willing to sacrifice himself to appease God's anger in order to save the people on the boat. He says, he's the one that says, throw me in the water in order to save all of you. And we see this in Jonah 1, 12 through 15. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea, and the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Now, admittedly, this story here, it's not a perfect parallel to Yeshua. But it does, again, a prefiguration just shows you kind of a type. It gives you broad strokes of what the Messiah would be like and what the Messiah would accomplish. I can't say it's a perfect parallel because there are differences. First of all, Jonah wasn't innocent where Yeshua was, obviously. Because it was actually Jonah's disobedience that did immediately jeopardize the lives of the sailors. Also, unlike the Jewish authorities who sought Yeshua's death to the point that they actually said at one point in their ignorance, may his blood be upon them for their guilt, the sailors, as we see, did not want that guilt of the shedding of this man's blood upon them. That's why they were worried about throwing him into the sea. Because they're like, well, we don't want to be held by God as responsible for the death of this man. Nevertheless, as Jonah is only a prefiguration or a sign, it doesn't have to be a perfect parallel. What is important that is we do see is that Jonah was willing to sacrifice his life to save the lives of others. And of course, that's what we see in Yeshua. Yeshua willingly went to the cross in order to save others. And there's many verses, of course, we could use to establish this. But I think John 10, 11 through 18 distinctly demonstrates it. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and, they, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. And so in saying that the only sign that he, Yeshua, would give 
to the, when they asked him for a sign is the sign of Jonah. He was specifically referring to, yes, that he, he would die and then he would return from the dead. But part of that sign is that Yeshua planned to freely and willingly give up his life for his flock. Just as, like I said, Jonah did, he was ready to give up his life in order to save those men on the ship. Now, in regards to the actual sign of the death and resurrection, sometimes, and I think it's because of the way it's often depicted in cartoons or in images, we don't always think of, Yeshu- of Jonah's experience in the belly of the fish in those terms, as being a death and a resurrection. But those two ideas, death and resurrection, are clearly represented. The idea of death and rebirth is clearly represented in the story of Jonah. So to see this, let's hear the words of Jonah's account of being in the belly of the fish, as found in Jonah 1, 17 through 2, 10. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The waters surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the the mornings of the mountains. And the earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. The passage here clearly shows us that Jonah's swallowing by the fish was, in essence, his descent into the grave, into death. We see this in the description of Jonah's words when he cries out to the Lord. He said that the waters surrounded his soul, literally his ne- it's, they surrounded his nephesh. It speaks to that, to the tangible aspect of his life that is just being drowned, is being snuffed out. The descent into the deeps of the sea is compared to having the bars of earth closed behind him, as though he was being imprisoned in Hades, or in the Hebrew, in Sheol. Jodah actually even calls his tomb within the belly of the fish Sheol, which again is a place It's that resting place of the dead, but you have to understand the depiction of Sheol is that it's a place of absolute darkness and stillness to which the dead go, the dead go. And when you're in Sheol, one idea out there is that, you know, both the righteous and the unrighteous go. That's not just an idea out there, that's reality. But that the one idea is that when you're in Sheol, you are cut off from life and you are cut off from God only there to await the resurrection. And it makes complete sense that the belly of the fish would be compared to Sheol. After all, it was only by a miracle that Jonah was not crushed and didn't suffocate within the first 30 seconds of being swallowed. Again, I think too often people envision the old Disney movie of Pinocchio when they think of Jonah, and they think of when Pinocchio and Geppetto get swallowed by... um, the whale uh, Monstro um, in that movie. And how do you, when they picture it in the belly of that whale, how is it pictured? Well, the belly is pictured as this huge cave, like maybe at least the size of this room here, if not larger. And you see that they're floating on like driftwood and, and the wreckage of a ship that's inside it. And they actually, and if you got, I actually went to YouTube and found the clip last night. They have a table, they have a bed, there's a lamp with a fire, and then they're living inside the whale. And I think we get that picture when Jonah got swallowed by the fish, that's what it was like for him. And again, the veggie tales, if that's the, the story you're familiar with, that's exactly how it, Jonah's pictured as well when he gets swallowed by the, ra- by, the, by the fish there. They have full mobility, they can move around, there's breathable air. He's like, yeah, I'm trapped in here, but I can survive. But this wouldn't have been Jonah's experience. 
We've got to put ground this in reality. If we truly believe the story of Jonah occurred and it did, well then ground it in reality. He would have been compressed inside the fish completely. He wouldn't have been able to move. He wouldn't have been able to see. And like I said, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have been able to breathe in there. There's no air pocket or air sac for him to breathe. That's why I said it's a miracle he was able to be there for three days and three nights. God was sustaining him that whatever spark of life that was still in him, that was only there because God was sustaining it. But Again, completely compressed, cannot move, cannot see, cannot breathe. All senses are completely gone. Again, this is how Sheol is envisioned. Jonah was experiencing that complete darkness and stillness, and he would have probably, I have to imagine, he felt completely cut off from God at that moment. So that in three days and three nights, all that would have been left was his consciousness, just thought. For all intents and purposes, Jonah was dead in that fish. But then when Jonah finally was broken and he cries out to God, he discovered that actually he wasn't cut off from God yet. For his prayer was answered upon his repentance. And we know he repented because, as we just read, Jonah says, he will sacrifice unto God with thanksgiving, and in doing so, he expected salvation. Fully plant, you know, that's the promise he's making there. If I survive this, God, when I'm back in Israel, I will make the trip to Jerusalem. I will go make that sacrifice of thanksgiving, showing that you and I are, I am thankful to you and that you and I have shalom together. Now at this point, we then read that the fish vomited Jonah out onto the dry land, representing Jonah's resurrection from the dead, or his escape from Sheol. And that he once again returned to the light. He was able to move. He was able to breathe. And most important, like I said, he realized, I have not been cut off from the Lord. This resurrection from the dead by Jonah prefigures Yeshua's resurrection. And I realize the image of a large fish retching out the contents of its stomach onto the shore does not seem an appropriate comparison to the glorious beauty that we associate with the empty tomb. But nonetheless, it shows a return from Sheol to life after three days and three nights. But the comparison between Jonah and Yeshua does not end there in just the death and the resurrection. For what Jonah did next also prefigures what would occur after Yeshua's resurrection. And furthermore, it hammers home what was the purpose of the sign of Jonah. After Jonah was vomited out of the fish... God once again commanded him, go to Nineveh and preach about the impending judgment against the city. This is described to us in Jonah 3, 1 through 5 and verse 10. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth, from the greatest to the least of them. Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. Now, if we just focus on the numbers first here, and this is a more surface comparison between Jonah and Yeshua, but I think it's still interesting, is we notice that it says Jonah preached for a time period of 40 days before they would be overthrown. 40 days, this mirrors the time period spent by Yeshua after the resurrection, speaking and teaching to his apostles about the kingdom of God. Acts 1, 3 tells us the following. To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So we have a parallel 40 days of preaching after their respective resurrections. However, what is more important is to whom they were preaching and what were they preaching. 
As we've already established, the Ninevites were not the children of Israel, but rather they were the surrounding nations. They were the enemies of Israel. They were goyim. They didn't share in the covenants with God that God had made through Avraham or God had made at Sinai through Moses. In fact, as I pointed out earlier, they are the enemies. And it was this reason, again, that Jonah originally disobeyed God and he tried to abandon his calling. For through Jonah, we have one of the best examples we see in the Tanakh of how God seeks to extend his mercy, not just to the children of Israel, but through the children of Israel to all people. Now from the text, we do not know why the Ninevites actually believe Jonah's prophesying against them. You know, you know, we have our own gods, and who are you, this Israelite, who in our eyes is some small nation that we always defeat in battle, you know, um, and we, you know, in the yeshiva in the last several weeks, we've been looking more at Hezekiah's reign and when um, King Sennacherib of the, um, from Nineveh of the, of the Assyrians came and how he mocked God and said, do you not realize how many gods I've defeated and you think your God's going to spare you from, um, from my, me and my armies? So we knew the, we can see that gener- generation or two after this, the Assyrians had no respect. So we don't know exactly why they actually when they heard Jonah's call, they actually responded to it. But in trying to guess why may they have, again, we have, I mentioned at the beginning that we have one commentator saying, well, there was an eclipse that occurred at that time, and that was a sign that put fear in them. But there was, there's other commentators, and I have to wonder if they may be onto something. They've wondered, maybe in Jonah's prophesying, bringing this message to them, maybe he told his story of being in the fish and that his death and in kind of his in essence death and resurrection out of the fish provided a sign that his testimony against them was true now again that's speculation but it would make sense and i even to some degree i have to wonder if maybe the words of yeshua in 11 luke eleven thirty might be making reference to this For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. Right there, Yeshua said, Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites. So maybe that is referencing Jonah's story of death and resurrection through the fish was was a sign that got their attention, made them listen. Now if this is the case, then we see how Jonah's resurrection from the dead was a sign to a foreign people of the need to repent in order to be forgiven. His message was of the need to repent, and his resurrection from the fish was the sign that confirmed the power behind that message. Similarly, Yeshua's resurrection was a sign for all people, Jew and Gentile, to repent in order to receive forgiveness for their sins from the one who had the power to forgive. And this aligns with what we see after Yeshua's resurrection, and that Yeshua told his disciples to go out to all nations preaching the need of repentance and forgiveness. So yes, start with Israel, but ultimately go to all nations with this message. We see it first in Acts 1, 7 through 8. And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And then we see the following in 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 20. Now if Messiah is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Messiah is not risen. If Messiah is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Messiah, whom he did not whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Messiah is not risen. And if Messiah is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Messiah have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Messiah, we are of all men the most pitiable. 
But now Messiah is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Thus Yeshua commanded the apostles to witness about him to the ends of the earth. And what was witnessed and preached was Messiah resurrected from the, from the dead. Paul specifically emphasizes here in his letter to the assembly in Corinth that their faith hinges on the resurrection. Now, the forgiveness of sin, that's what happened on the cross at Passover. But the sign that that sacrifice was accepted is the resurrection. And it's only through that resurrection that we can have confidence that our sins actually are forgiven. This is the sign that indicates there is life after death because of what Yeshua accomplished on the cross when he, when he, when he conquered sin and its accompanying, accompanying punishment of death. Now finally, once we see that the resurrection is not only a sign of confirmation that the sacrifice of Yeshua was accepted and that he had conquered both sin and death, it's also a sign calling all nations to repentance. And we, when we see that, we can better understand the words of, that Yeshua spoke to the scribes and the Pharisees who had asked for a sign. Remember, he called them a wicked and an adulterous generation for seeking after a sign. And remember, we have to, let's keep the full context of when Yeshua says that as well. Because when you read that in Matthew, they asked for this sign immediately after they had blasphemed the Holy Spirit by attributing the power of Yeshua's miracles, the power the behind the healings and the miracles to, that Yeshua was performing, to the power of Beelzebub, the Lord of Flies, meaning the Lord of Death. They had just done that, and then they go and ask, have the audacity to ask for a sign. And Yeshua said, we read it earlier, but Yeshua said the following after talking about the sign of Jonah. Again, he says in Matthew 12, 41 through 42. And the men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. In comparing the scribes and the Pharisees that were confronted, again, not all scribes, not all Pharisees, we always have to keep that in mind, but the ones who were there challenging him, he, when he compares them to the Ninevites, and when he compares them to the Queen of the South, Yeshua found the Jewish teachers that challenging him, they were lacking when set beside their Gentile counterparts from these past centuries. And he found him lacking to the point that he actually says these Gentiles who actually did heed repentance or did hear the word of God and responded to it, they will actually condemn you at the resurrection. And this had to have been shocking for the crowd to hear. Because these Jewish leaders, they had the Torah. They were the, the, kind of the keepers of the Torah. They were the ones who expounded upon it and applied it to the Jewish, the Jews' daily lives. They were the ones who lived in an everlasting covenant with God that was set by Avraham and who were trying to adhere, as they understood it, to the covenant at Sinai. And above all this, the teachers, again, they were the religious and the legal leaders responsible for interpreting, applying, and judging others according to the covenant and the commandments of the Torah. Yet here Yeshua says, they will be condemned by Goyim, who did not know the Torah, who did not exist in a covenant with God. And the reason this condemnation will occur, although Yeshua only implies it rather than specifically ex explicitly stating it, is that the Ninevites of the generation of Jonah and the queen of the south who sought out Solomon's wisdom knew God better than the Jewish teachers who were challenging Yeshua. They knew him in their, in their hearts. Although they didn't have the factual knowledge of the covenant with Avraham, they didn't know the teachings of Torah, they possessed in their hearts some type of relational knowledge in that moment when they heard the call, they heard the word of the Lord being either called, prophesied to them or taught to them. 
that all of a sudden, in their heart, they acknowledged the God of Avraham. The, the God of Avraham that did establish that everlasting covenant and who spoke out of the cloud atop Sinai and, and brought forth the Torah. Now, how can I say this? How can I say they knew God more than the scribes and the Pharisees? It's because when they heard the voice of God, they responded to it. And even more so, they knew the voice because the Ninevites and the Queen of the South that Yeshua references, they only heard God's voice through intermediaries. Again, through the prophet Jonah, through the King Solomon. Even more dam or more worse for them is these Jewish leaders, when they rejected it, they were rejecting it, hearing it directly from the word. They were hearing the word speak through a fleshly form, but Yeshua was speaking directly to them. They were listening directly to the words of the Lagos. They saw the miracles but they didn't repent in their ways. Certainly such a rebuke is not easy to hear and accept. In fact, even if not seen as a rebuke, it can still be difficult for those who have been raised up from childhood knowing the, co knowing the covenants and knowing Torah to discover that someone outside of them might know the voice of God better than they do. After all, even Jonah who eventually responded to the voice of God through repentance and obedience. He went to Nineveh and preached the message. Again, had to experience death and resurrection to get there, but he did it. But even after the fact, he struggled seeing those outside the covenant of God responding to the voice and being forgiven. Jonah 3, 10 through 4, 3 states, Then God saw their works, that, their, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Think about that. He had just essentially experienced death and resurrection. And now he's saying, I'd rather die than live. Jonah became angry that God spared Nineveh, the enemies of Israel, to the point yeah, I would rather die than continue living. His hatred for Nineveh was so great that he couldn't accept that God would forgive them. And this is the very reason why Jonah tried to flee from God in the first place. He knew God, and he knew he would show mercy upon anyone who responds to that call of repentance. And this is quite remarkable about Jonah because it shows that he knew the nature of God well enough to know both his judgment and his mercy. He knew both. But yet at the same time, he fled. Which suggests maybe he didn't know well enough, though. He knew his judgment. He knew his mercy. Maybe he knew it in his head. But in, in his heart, initially, he didn't know it enough to respond in obedience. And instead, he had to go through this experience of being swallowed by the fish and experience death and resurrection before he would know God well enough to repent and then actually respond in obedience. But yet then, even after that, we see that he still doesn't fully comprehend God's mercy because he couldn't accept that God would grant it to others outside of Israel. The word spoken by Yeshua to the doubters of his generation, the example that was set by the actions and the responses of Jonah to the call to preach repentance to Nineveh, and the implications they have to both the Jew and the Gentile in their response to the death and resurrection of the Messiah are summarized well by Paul in his letter to the Romans. And we're going to finish with this. In closing, I want you to listen to Paul's explanation of how repentance and obedience as a response to God's voice determines whether or not you truly know God. Again, not head knowledge, but personal, relational knowledge. 
Does your heart truly know God? Romans 2, 17 through 29 says. Oh, actually, I, I'll go ahead and read it. Indeed, you are called a Jew and, the re- and rest on the law and make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor to the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You, therefore, who teach another, do you teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who, ab- you who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you? That's what... Yeshua was referring to when he said to those teachers who challenged him, and like I said, it just, and, and it blasphemed the Holy Spirit. He said, the people of Nineveh, the queen of the south, they're going to be your judges. They're the uncircumcised, but they're going to be your judges. And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you? Who with your written code and, circumci- and circumcision or a transgressor of the law. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So when we think about the sign of Jonah... It's the sign of death and resurrection, but what does that call everyone to, and how should they respond? And again, we need to get into majoring in the majors. Focus on what's most important. We need to take this sign of Jonah out to the Ninevites, out to the people of the South, out to those who are uncircumcised. That's our mission. That's what Yeshua has called us to do. We can't get distracted by these other things. We have to stay focused on just doing that. It's our duty to praise the master of all, to ascribe greatness to the author of creation. For he made us unlike the nations of the land and has not placed us like the families of the earth. He has not made our portion like theirs and our lot like all their multitudes. And we bend the knee and bow and acknowledge our thanks before the king over kings, the holy one, blessed be he. He stretches out heaven, establishes earth's foundation, the seat of his glories in the heavens above, and the presence of his power is in the most exalted heights. He is our God, there is none other. True is our king, there is nothing beside him. As it is written in his Torah, you shall know this day and take to your heart that the Lord, he is God, in the heavens above and on the earth below, there is none other. Amen.